There's not always common ground between Democrats and Republicans in Albany, but Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani, a Queens Democrat, has helped bridge that gap, uniting state lawmakers of both parties in opposition to legislation he introduced in May, which is designed to stop state tax-deductible donations from being ultimately used by charities that support Israeli settlement operations that effectively expel Palestinians from land they've been living on. For more on the legislation, as well as the subsequent debate it has prompted, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Assemblymember Mamdani. Welcome back to the show, Assemblymember. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. So I gave the Reader's Digest version of your legislation. Can you elaborate on what you envision with this legislation if it became law? Yeah, so what this legislation would do would be to make sure that New York State does not continue to effectively subsidize war crimes. And I use those words very intentionally because Israeli settlements are illegal as per international law and specifically the Geneva Convention. And what we have right now is a situation where our country, the United States, has determined that none of its federal aid should be used in the maintenance or expansion of settlements. But we here in New York State are allowing charities registered through our state law to send more than $60 million a year for those very purposes. That contradiction is one that is having an immensely negative impact upon so many people across the occupied territories and is one that we are complicit in as lawmakers here in New York State. From an administrative perspective, is this legislation or this type of legislation necessary? For example, does the state attorney general, whose office has oversight over charities, have the existing authority to deter the practice of tax-exempt donations uh, effectively making it over to Israel in this way? So first, I would just clarify, it's, it's not making it over to Israel, it's, it's making it over to the settlements. And those sure. are two separate things. The attorney general has broad discretion through her charities bureau in investigating charities. Specifically, there is a line that, that provides the attorney general with discretion around determining wrongdoing with regards to the actions of, of charities registered in New York State and the violation, perhaps, of the broad sense of charitable purpose. The reason that I introduced this legislation is because a number of organizations came to me many months ago with the evidence of New York State registered charities engaging in such uh, financing. And they informed me that they had, in fact, had a meeting with the Charities Bureau at the Attorney General's office, laying out these very clear and explicit violations. And the response that they received was that it was not explicit enough in the law whether these kinds of actions constituted violations of a charitable purpose or constituted wrongdoing. And so what the motivation of this legislation is in an immediate sense is to provide that clarity in New York state law to say that if you are violating the Geneva Convention and you are doing so specifically with regards to the maintenance and expansion of Israeli settlements, then that is not considered a charitable purpose. And that should not be allowed to continue as a charity registered here in New York State. In putting together your legislation and thinking about this issue, have you come across previous examples where the state has made other value judgments in terms of the merit of work that a charity is doing and whether contributions to it should be tax deductible? This is the first of its kind in, in the nation with regards to the clear affirmation of, of human rights that, that Palestinians should hold in the occupied territories and frankly in general across state governments in this country. With regards to the litigation of charitable purpose, I haven't personally heard of other pieces of legislation that seek to litigate what is a charitable purpose here in New York State, but I've also only been in New York State legislature since January of 2021. This legislation specifically identifies Israel in the bill language and doesn't use broader language that might encompass other countries doing something similar if that type of situation existed or committing their own war crimes or violations of international law. Why is that? So there are a number of reasons. First and foremost, this legislation is built upon the violation of the Geneva Convention. That is what provides it with the rationale as to why this should not be considered a charitable purpose. And we were very intentional about using that as the basis for pursuing this legislation because it opens the door to the use of that same set of 
laws for future legislation with regards to any other country or any other charities. There is a world in which we could introduce this legislation without that and just simply saying that contributing funding to Israeli settlements is illegal. But we use that very intentionally. The second point is that what I have found time and again is if you are not explicit with regards to the actions of anything to do in relation to Israel, then you cannot be confident that any of the law or the policy will actually be applied to the very reasons that you introduced this in the first place. I mean, if we look at the origins of this legislation, there was a response from the Attorney General's office that this was not explicit enough in the law. So we were seeking to meet that very concern. One thing that I have heard time and again is that this legislation is singling out Israel and it's unique in doing so. And what I would say in response is that I am not the person who came up with the idea of singling out Israel. If anything, this country singles out Israel with $3.8 billion in military aid every year, something that no other country receives from the United States to that extent. This is a legislature which has for many years introduced legislation seeking to chill the free expression of those looking to support Palestinian human rights. We have a controller who once Ben and Jerry's said that they would stop selling their products in the settlements. Our controller, Tom DiNapoli, pulled out New York State pension funds from Unilever, the parent company for Ben and Jerry's. This is a legislature where on quite regular, if not annual basis, we have a number of legislators who go on a trip to Israel. And so time and time again, it is a unique part of political life here in New York City and New York State. And so this is a response to say that there has to also be accountability and consistency when it comes to the foreign policy of this country, which is stated in opposition to settlements, and the actions of our state, which are permitting those very settlements to continue. Because And, 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 I, and I want to be very clear in that $60 million is in and of itself a sizable amount of money, but its significance doesn't simply come from its scale. It also comes from the fact that more often than not, this funding also constitutes the majority of the operating revenue and funding that these Israeli settler organizations receive. So without this funding, there are entire organizations that may not be able to continue operating in the manner in which they are. And I'll give a couple examples. You have an Israeli minister uh, by the name of Smotrich, who was most prominently in the news by his calls to wipe out an entire town. And he was he was rightfully widely condemned for that. He founded an organization called Regavim. Regavim is an organization that over the past three years, from, from 2019 to 2021, the number one donor to Regavim was a New York State registered charity called the Central Fund of Israel. In those three years, 35% of all of Regavim's donations came from the Central Fund of Israel. And this is an organization that has made it very explicit that it is intent on evicting any Arabs from territories that it seeks to control. And that's the kind of organization that our state government is allowing to continue operating. So going back to the original question, though, in terms of the language, and you kind of brought this point up, though, in your answer, the attorney general's office has said their hands are tied to a certain degree. So if another situation was to emerge where someone was found to be violating, say, the Geneva Convention, why not write the bill in a broader way so that it would just apply to charities that are maybe supporting activities that are in violation of the Geneva Convention? That way you don't necessarily need to revisit this issue every legislative session when you find more examples that require uh, action. And also you can avoid the sort of political sensitivity of Israel. I think one of the fundamental reasons you introduce legislation is to react to the reality that is in front of you. And if the evidence that is being presented to you is specific, then the attempt to craft a larger piece of legislation simply in the hopes of defanging any kind of likely opposition. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying about the opposition aspect. I'm saying so that you don't have to then revisit the issue 
in the future and that now the attorney general's office is already equipped with the necessary power if x y and z country is found to be violating the geneva convention and there's charities working in there just from a good legislating practice isn't that a common sense way that you should approach legislating that you are trying to consider future examples as you legislate i think it's an interesting point but it it flies in the face of so often what is the typical approach to legislating in Albany, which is that you legislate with regards to specificity. And then when anything further or example comes upon, you can build upon the existing legislation to expand it further. And I think that that is why we included the Geneva Convention as the foundation. And I think that in attempting to create legislation that is broad-based, that is universally applicable, you also do not get to speak specifically about what is going on right now in New York State which we have seen with these six, seven, eight, nine charities in the same manner that you do if you make it clear that this is the reality on the ground here in New York State. This is where we begin. If there's any evidence of any other charity that violates the Geneva Convention, I would be more than happy to to support that kind of legislation because this is not an opportunistic use of that as a reference point. Rather, it is a sincere creation of a foundation that is one that we say that we believe in, but we find so often when it comes to the actions related to Israel that there is a clear contradiction. And that's where, you know, growing up in this country and speaking about Palestinian human rights, again and again, you would come up, you would hear this term of PEP, progressive except Palestine. And you would see again and again that the exception is drawn when it comes to Palestinian human rights. And so what The intention here in this legislation is, in addition to what I've already stated, is to make it very clear that no longer will we draw an exception when it comes to human rights and justice and dignity simply because it applies to Palestinians. And after a quick break, we'll have more with Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani, a Queens Democrat. Don't go anywhere. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation with Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani, a Queens Democrat who's pushing legislation designed to stop state tax-deductible donations from being ultimately used by charities that support Israeli settlement operations that effectively expel Palestinians from land they've been living on. When you think about New York and engaging in international issues, do you think we should be taking a more active approach in terms of our values and the judgments that we put on other areas? For example, should we also be thinking about uh, prohibiting the sale of products that are made in countries with unsafe working conditions or whose leaders are potentially violating the Geneva Convention or or doing other things that are contrary to New York or, or American values? Should we stop at just legislation like yours, which deals with tax-exempt donations? I think that we should legislate in a manner that makes our practices consistent with our political beliefs. If we say that we do not believe that settlements should be receiving funding, then we need to ensure that our state governments are practicing the same approach in, in the policy that they're setting. And, you know, values are very cheap if you don't actually follow through on holding them. And that is, you know, one of the many big inspirations for me is thinking about the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And one of the key reasons why that apartheid regime fell was because of the solidarity that was exhibited by so many, including here in Albany, you know, in thinking of Al Van and Roger Green, who were some of the most outspoken advocates of taking American funding and and pension funding and, and New York State kind of complicity in the apartheid regime and ending it and starting a new chapter of actual solidarity. So I would say, yes, I I don't think that we can say here in New York State and in in Albany that 
we can only focus on the matters that are explicitly taking place here within the borders of our state, when in fact we know that especially New York City is a global capital. And the laws that we have on the books in the state have a lot to do with the actions that exist outside of it. And we need to understand and reckon with our complicity in the violations of international law and things of that nature when we are crafting our laws. How far, though, do we have to go when it comes to exercising and actually living our values? Because that could be a pretty uncomfortable situation if we were to say, ban products that are made in China because of the country's treatment of the Uyghur population, for example. So is there a clear line? Is it like pornography? I know it when I see it in terms of where we need to stand up. How should we think about it? I don't have a, an answer for you in this moment that can definitively outline where to pursue and, and at what point until. But I think that at the very least, there should be a consistency with regards to what our federal government's foreign policy is and what our state's domestic policy is. If the two things are in contradiction, then it is a clear example of a place where we should act. And that is what this legislation is about, is, is bringing the two things into one. In so much of the pushback, you, you may notice that almost all of it, if not all of it, never says the word settlements. It always says Israel. It never says the word settlements. And part of that is very intentional in that settlements in and of themselves cannot be defended. And so, so much of the opposition and the pushback is seeking to distract from the legislation itself and mischaracterize it in a manner that the entire conversation becomes about that description. The presidents of this country, more often than not, whether we're talking about Biden, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Bill Clinton, they have said that they are in opposition to settlements, and that's the official policy of this country. But to introduce legislation that simply ensures that our state is consistent with that has been treated as such an illegitimate piece of legislation when, in fact, it is seeking to simply bring consistency to our law and our positions. What do you think it would take for Palestine and the Palestinian people to wield the same levels of soft power in Albany and throughout New York that Israel and supporters of Israel are able to wield? Is it a question of time? Is it a question of money? Is it a question of just the way people see people look like themselves as opposed to seeing people who might not look like them in the halls of Albany? How does that dynamic change? You know, I think the dynamic changes by making it clear to all New Yorkers that their voices are respected and they are heard here in Albany. And what I mean by that is that two years ago, there were mass protests across New York City, protests in Sunnyside, Queens, in, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, in Midtown, East in Manhattan, where tens of thousands of New Yorkers took to the streets in support of Palestinian human rights. And yet, so many of those same New Yorkers do not feel like they have a role to play when it comes to state politics. And I can tell you, as somebody who got into politics through advocacy for Palestinian human rights, that it can be quite disempowering when thinking of how can I have an impact? How can I have a role? Because you're told, actually, this is a federal policy. If you want to talk about the military aid, actually, this is, you know, you have to contact your one congressman or there's this other congressman you start to wonder whether you can have any real material impact on this conversation and these policies at all. And what the hope is in this legislation is not simply to make our state laws consistent with our country's foreign policy, but also to make it clear to the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, frankly, if not millions of New Yorkers who believe in Palestinian human rights, and more importantly, who believe that our state should not effectively subsidize war crimes, that there is a role for them in this political process. And I think when you open that door, it allows people to believe. And it is that belief that can oftentimes be the first step in true and sincere engagement in the political process. And I think for too long, it has not been clear enough to New Yorkers who care about these issues, how they can get involved and what they can do. And for all of the pushback that I have received in Albany, I have felt such support and excitement and inspiration from constituents across my district, as well as New Yorkers across this entire state, who have said that they didn't realize how they could actually 
take action as New Yorkers on this issue, and that this provides them the tools with which to speak to their neighbors about the unacceptable contradictions that come from our stated values and the ones that we actually practice. Well, finally, you talked about values and, and living your values. And I wonder if you feel like by living your values as a legislator and pushing what you believe in has or will marginalize you at all in a body that is clearly not on the same page as you, including the leadership. So do you feel like this was potentially a mistake for you to push this issue in terms of your ability to navigate the assembly and try to advance other issues? I don't think it was a mistake. I think if I was worried about how my beliefs would hinder my ability to move through Albany, I would have never have run for office. Uh, because simply by virtue of being a socialist, you are told that your ability to influence the actions of Albany is diminished to, to, to great extents. And I have found that in my two and a half years, there has been so much that I've been so proud to both be a part of and to lead. And it has always been with my values and my beliefs very clearly illustrated to my colleagues and also to myself, because this is a place that oftentimes it, it, it can incentivize you putting forward parts of yourself and silencing others. But I think the, the beautiful thing about being an elected official who's part of a mass movement organization like DSA is that I am constantly reminded both by myself and by rank and file members of the organization, what it was that I ran to do and what the beliefs were that I said that I had and that I continue to have and the importance and the necessity of being true to those things throughout all of it. Well, we've been speaking with Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani. He is a Queens Democrat. Assemblymember, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, David. It's always a pleasure. Support for Capital Press Room provided by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Communities across the Empire State have stories to tell. A roadside marker funded by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation can help your town or city educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote local tourism. More about the Pomeroy Foundation's New York State Historic Marker Grant Program for 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local state and federal government entities at wgpfoundation.org.